Welcome everyone to the year-end Q&A video. I asked for questions, you gave them, and now I'm going to answer them. So I opened this up to patrons and YouTube members first, and then I made a community post on YouTube, and then I also made a tweet. So I gave it like a good week for people to get their questions in, and then I gathered them all. And there were well over a hundred, so this will probably be a long video. This background here was made by Pulse Skeleton, who sent it to me on Twitter, so thanks a lot for that. I was uh, really excited to have this and use it somewhere, so I figured the Q&A video would be a great, great place to use it. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And in the background, I'm just gonna have some random gameplay from a bunch of mostly indie games. I'll put the name of the game at the bottom of the screen so you can check out whatever looks cool to you. But uh, yeah, like I said, this is probably gonna be a long one and it's unscripted, so I'm probably gonna go off on a bunch of tangents about stuff. I mean, that's why I script my videos, because uh, editing a voiceover where I'm just talking would be an absolute nightmare. But I don't plan to edit this much, so. Anyway, uh, grab a drink, relax, and uh, let's just jump right in. So I figured the most logical place to start would be with these questions. What inspired you to make videos? Where does your inspiration to make videos come from? What made you want to make video games content? I've just started watching and love your videos so far, and I'm curious as to what drove your courage and passion to be a creator. Well, I mean, I I've always wanted to do something like this, and I've been watching YouTube for a long time. And a few years ago, I well, I guess it was back in like 2016 or so, uh, I started a Let's Play channel, and that channel doesn't exist anymore. But I did it off and on for like, a year and a half or so and this was at the tail end of when let's plays were popular on youtube so there was no hope of this channel going anywhere but i just kind of enjoyed doing it i i liked playing games and i liked uh doing the commentary and stuff and it was fun but by the time i was done with it i think i had like four subscribers and two of them were friends of mine so i couldn't even get like my friends to subscribe to this channel but again like i didn't really care but then I, uh, yeah, I kind of gave up, gave up on that, and then I, a few years later, I tried streaming on Twitch. And I did that for about two months, and it was okay, but uh, always with streaming, I just felt really uncomfortable. Like, you want people to come in to watch your stream, but then anytime someone would come in, I'd get really nervous and, like, self-conscious, and I just, I, I don't know, I just never felt comfortable streaming. I don't really know how people, how people do it, but... But yeah, so I did that for a couple months and then, but then still I was just like, oh, I really want to do something. And so finally, earlier this year, I just I just came up with the idea of Dungeon Chill and then I, I just started making videos and, and um, it all kind of just came together. Like I found a vehicle that felt comfortable and just a style that I, that I liked and felt right. So that's how it all came to be. Uh, next, why the name Dungeon Chill? I don't really know exactly. Yeah, I, I came up with it and I don't know. I, I can walk you through like the emotional journey that I took when I when I first thought of the name. Came up with it and I, at first I was like, yeah, that's cool. And then like a few minutes later, I was like, nah, that's a stupid name. Like, what is, what is that? <laughs> but I just kept, I don't know, it just stuck with me for like a few days and I kept thinking about it. And I was like, yeah, you know, it might work. And then finally, I was just like, yeah, this is it. This is what the name is. Um, and I was also like thinking, okay, so when people do this kind of stuff, like they get called by whatever their channel name is. So is like, I'm gonna be called Dungeon Chill. Is that like the name of a person? Does that, does that make sense? And I was like, uh, but then I finally just decided like, I don't care. It doesn't matter. <laughs> like, uh, uh, it, it fits like <clears throat> the vibe and you know what I'm, what I feel like I'm trying to, to do here. So I was just like, yeah, whatever, people call me Dungeon Chill, I don't care. And uh, and that was it. So it's really kind of anticlimactic, but I don't know. I think you'll find a kind of theme with me, at least as far as like YouTube and the channel itself is concerned, is like my, my main thing is like, I don't really give a shit. Uh, <laughs> like, I, I care a lot about the videos and creating the videos, but as far as like YouTube and like whatever weird meta like creators have and YouTube itself has for itself, um, I, I really try not to care too much about any of that stuff and I just focus on making the videos. So yeah, the same went for the name of the channel. 
dungeon chill. This is this is what it is. Next one. Will you cover my bad? I couldn't resist. Oh, half HP. You're on thin ice, buddy. What was the first game you played that made you go, shit, I got to tell people about this or inspired you to make videos on obscure games? I think the first one was Lunacy. I had actually recorded the playthrough for Lunacy in early 2022. Like before I knew about Dungeon Chill, like I was going to do Dungeon Chill or anything. I was just like, I'd played a bit of Lunacy before, like a couple years before, and then I was just got struck. Like I said, I streamed and did a Let's Play channel and stuff, and then I was still like, oh, what do I do? Um, and then I just thought of the game Lunacy, and I was like, I want to make a video on this. So obviously, like, the end goal would have been, yeah, put it on YouTube, but at the time, I didn't know about Dungeon Chill or this idea for the channel. But I recorded the playthrough, I took notes, I started to write a script, and then I kind of, like, let it go. Uh, it just wasn't feeling right. And then again, earlier this year came up with the idea of Dungeon Chill and I was like, I need to do this video on Lunacy. So that became the first longer like review video on the channel. And uh, and yeah, it just went from there. Uh, next one, few few people asked this one. What was your favorite video to make so far? What was your favorite game that you've talked about so far? What is the video you feel most proud of having made? Uh, again, Lunacy. Uh, it was the first long video for the channel, so it was a lot of work and it it just kind of all came together. I mean, I haven't watched that video since I made it, but I think if I would look back on it now, I, there's probably like technical things and maybe some little tweaks I would make to it. But for the most part, like I'm pretty happy with how that video turned out. And then, uh, uh, have you ever abandoned an idea for a video? Maybe you didn't like the final product, the topic was too unknown to have some proper searches, etc. I've abandoned, like in the beginning, when I was doing the shorter videos, indie previews, I've abandoned a couple of those just because, I don't know, I can't really remember the reasons, just one reason or another. I was just like, ah, I'm not feeling it, or I don't have time to make this one, or I don't know, something. Something came up and I've abandoned a couple of those. But as far as longer videos, I I haven't yet abandoned a longer video. The channel's still young though, so there's still time. But there are a couple that I've started and I started capturing gameplay and taking notes, but I've kind of set aside for one reason or another. There's three of them that I've done that for, but I fully intend to go back to those at some point. And then about the topic being too unknown for proper searches, I mean, I don't really care about that, to be honest. Like, I'm, I wanna cover what I'm gonna cover, and it doesn't matter if nobody knows what it is. There are ways to get people interested in a game that they don't know about. I mean, you can do it with titles or thumbnails. I mean, Cosmology of Kyoto is the most viewed video on the channel. And who the hell knew about that game? I mean, a few people did, but not that many. I think the reason so many people clicked on that video is because of the title and the thumbnail. So there are definitely things you can do to entice people. I think if I would have just called that video like Cosmology of Kyoto Review, like, yeah, nobody would have probably, not that many people would have clicked on it, but the scariest educational game ever made, that's a bit more mysterious. So yeah, there are things you can do. Another couple questions here. What's your thought process when you gotta look for another game to review? All the games on your channel, as you said in the last video, you choose for being interesting and having something inside them worthwhile, but how do you find such games? Do you go with your guts or do you have some general idea of what type of game you're gonna pick before playing it? Thank you and sorry for the convoluted question. Not that convoluted, I got it. Um, I would like to know how you decide which games you cover on your channel. Do you decide randomly or are you picking games you're interested in or are there other criteria and where do you find all the games you talked about so i have a list that i made when i started the channel with games i wanted to talk about and i'm constantly adding games to that list and then people also recommend games in the comments of videos and i anytime i see one of those i write them down on the list even if i've never heard of it or never played it before and some games on my list that i added i'd never played before but i've heard of or read about and i thought were interesting as far as how I've heard of some of these games, I read a lot of HardcoreGaming101.net, which is a website, and they cover just everything. Like, they've been going for a long time. I don't know how many years that site's been around, but they're completely devoted to just, like, covering any and all games. And they have a podcast called The Top... I forget the exact number, but it's, like, The Top 47,458 Games of All Time, something like that. 
they they shorten it to the top 47k games podcast and i listen to that a lot and they talk about a lot of like obscure stuff that i had never heard of before and so a lot of the ideas come from that like I, cosmology of kyoto i had read an article on hardcore gaming a long time ago about that like years ago and it's just always stuck in the back of my head and then like i remember in the summer i thought of that game that's what eventually led to me making the video on Cosmology of Kyoto, but I was looking for a way to play it because I don't actually own that game. And then I found out, like, obviously it's Abandonware, but if you could just go to download it from, like, my Abandonware, it's not going to run on, like, a normal configuration of DOSBox because it's actually running on, like, Windows 3.1 and just running it through DOS is not going to work. So then I, through searching, I just found the Collection Chamber, which configures a lot of those games which are made for like Windows 3.1 and stuff to run in DOSBox because basically he's running, he's getting the emulator to boot Windows 3.1 and then booting the game. So that's how those those uh, those games work on that website. So, but then yeah, the collection chamber, just kind of searching through their catalog, catalog, I found a lot of stuff too. Like that's how I found the Are You Afraid of the Dark game. I'd never heard I never, I never knew there was an Are You Afraid of the Dark game until I saw it on Collection Chamber, and I remember finding that in the summer, around the time when I found Cosmology of Kyoto, and I tried it out, and I was just like, oh my god, I can't wait until Halloween, because that's when I'm going to talk about this game. And so, stuff like that happens uh, all the time. But then, going deeper, like as far as how I schedule the games, it's based on... Right now, it's based on time because I have a limited amount of time to do stuff for the channel. I don't do YouTube full time. So I've been picking games this year that have taken like, I don't know, for the most part, like eight hours or less to play through and get footage for. Most of them shorter than that, like four to six hours, I would say. And yeah, so I, I want to keep a consistent upload schedule and the way it's worked out over the last few months has been every two weeks and I really want to stick to that. So two weeks is like a comfortable amount of time to play through these games that are a bit shorter and then write a script and make a video and, and get it uploaded on time. Uh, there are a lot of longer games that I want to cover but I just don't have the time for them right now. So, so a lot of it comes down to how long it's going to take me to play through the game and make the video and make sure I get a video out every two weeks. And that's just a personal thing. Like I just really want to stick to that that upload schedule. And then looking at the list of games, if it's a game I've played before, like I just know, I'm like, okay, this is gonna make a good video. I'll just play it and make the video. Um, but if it's something I haven't played before, I usually pick like a couple games just in case. And it's like, oh, I'm not really feeling this one. And there's like this undefined feeling I get when I play a game where it's just like, this is gonna make a good video. And and that's the most important thing because I feel like, I don't really think of what I'm doing as a review, like in the traditional sense, because I feel like a review is like, you know, looking at the pros and cons of a game and telling you whether or not it's something that's worth playing. And, uh, but for me, I, I really don't care if you play it or not. <laughs> like, I, I, all I care about is if you watch the video. So yeah, like, I I think of what I'm doing as, it's just me, kind of like running up to you, game in hand, shoving it in your face and just being like, hey, isn't this weird? And if your reaction is just like, oh yeah, that is weird, then that's it, mission accomplished. Like, I don't care if the game is good or bad. Uh, it's just, is it is it interesting? Is it weird? Is it gonna make a good video? And uh, obscurity, people have mentioned, and people mention all the time in comments also like about me picking obscure games and like, yeah, I do. But obscurity isn't the be all, end all criteria for whether it's going to be a video. I think there will be games that I cover that are more well known as long as they fit the other criteria of whether it's an interesting thing to talk about. And I think that it would make a good entertaining video. So yeah, I hope that uh, answers your questions. Why do you, here we go, <laughs> this is kind of related. Why do you like reviewing and playing all these obscure games? I just think they're interesting. Like, I think they're cool to talk about. Like, I, I like the idea of having to do some work to get to the enjoyable or entertaining bits of a game. Not all the time. I mean, of course there are games that I play that I just wanna sit and relax and have a good time. But for the channel, I wanna choose stuff that maybe people wouldn't have the patience to get through, but I can because I, have that kind of drive to find that like hidden core of what's interesting about a game. So I think that's why. 
Who do you get compared to the most? Oh, Grimbeard, for sure. Like, <laughs> I mean, for good reason. I mean, I especially in the early videos, I stole his whole, like, format with the whole musical kind of bumpers and the, like, kind of hard cuts into them and stuff. Like, yeah, Grimbeard, for sure. And that's why in the Plague of the Moon video, I just addressed it, because uh, that was, like, I don't know, like, the second or third longer video that I, I'd done, and on the Lunacy video, Again, the first long video I did, I had so many people saying like, hey, have you heard of Grimbeard? Oh man, you remind me of Grimbeard. Whoa, did you, do you like Grimbeard? You must have been inspired by Grimbeard. And so I just decided to address it. And it's funny because the Plague of the Moon video was an early one and at the time, nobody watched that video. My videos at that point were getting around like a thousand views, high hundreds to like a thousand. And that was like the trend, but then, Plague of the Moon came out and I think it only got like 200 or 300 views when it for a while and so I just figured like you know I made this little I had this little thing about Grimbeard in there and you know whatever nobody's gonna watch it it's an early video I really didn't think my channel would take off for years so I was like only the only the most hardcore of of Dungeon Chilch fans will go back to watch this one but then of course a couple months later the channel just kind of blew up and now that video has like, I don't know, like 60,000 views. So like <laughs> all these people heard me like, oh yeah, I was inspired by Grimbeard. <laughs> and like, <laughs> I don't know, I just didn't expect. It. So I, I got a lot of like very nice comments from people, very encouraging comments from people. So I really appreciate that. But uh, I, I don't know, I guess I was trying to be kind of modest in that video, but you know, I knew what I was doing. I knew like, yeah, I like this guy's stuff and I want to, kind of take it and, you know, work with it, and then I'll try to figure out my own style along the way. And that's, I feel like that's now kind of what happened. And now my videos are a bit more my own. I've seen people compare me to other channels in the comments, and to be honest, I haven't heard of any of them. <laughs> like this next one. So thank you for that question. Uh, and the next one, did you take inspirations from Nexpo? No, I didn't, because until you asked this question, I had no idea who Nexpo was. And then I looked them up and I saw they have like over 3 million subscribers. And I was like, I've never heard of this channel. Like, I, I don't even think I've ever been recommended one of their videos. Like, I just never heard of it. And it just goes to show you how vast YouTube is because someone with like 3 million subscribers in the same niche covering the same stuff like I'd never even heard of so but no I didn't take any inspiration because I'd never seen any of their videos um another person another one I've been getting recently on like the Galarian's video and the Shadow of Memories video is Let's Play which again never heard of them uh and so many people were like oh it looks like you're going through the the Let's Play's greatest hits and I was like I guess I, I I don't know, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's totally true. I had I had no idea who they were, and then I looked them up, and I was like, oh yeah, they did Galarians, they've done Shadow of Memories or Shadow of Destiny, you know, whatever you want to, whatever side of the pond you're on. Uh, and I was like, yeah, okay, well, I guess I am. I didn't know, <laughs> you know. But again, that just goes to show how vast uh, YouTube is and how big the uh, retro gaming space is. But yeah, thank you for that question and. Uh, Nexpo's a good recommendation, so I'll have to check them out. Next question, which gaming reviewers slash critics in YouTube do you enjoy watching? Uh, well, Grimbeard, of course, as I mentioned. Um, I like Mandalore, he's he's a staple. Civi is great. Uh, Strategy is really good. Charlatan Wonder. I also like uh, Oats and Goats, who's a Super Metroid speedrunner, and uh, he does a lot of like randomizers and challenge runs and stuff. And I love Super Metroid; it's one of my favorite games, so I really enjoy watching uh, his stuff. Those are like the bigger channels that I watch, and there's definitely others like LGR, My Life in Gaming, uh, people like that. But I'd actually like to take this opportunity to point out some smaller channels that I really enjoy watching and that have also been supportive of my channel in one way or another. So I'd like to highlight some of these channels as well. So first of all, I wanna shout out No Caps. Uh, they cover a lot of indie games. So if you're someone who joined the channel because of the indie previews that I did, but those have kind of fallen off recently, No Caps covers indie games and they upload very frequently, every few days, and they just do short videos. It's very relaxed. 
uh, really cool, and I've I've discovered a lot of indie games that I didn't know about through their channel. So I would really recommend No Caps if you're into indie games. Another channel is Void Brand. We started posting videos around the same time, and he covers a lot of old like DOS games and stuff like that. And he recently did several videos on the Ultima series. He's done Ultima Underworld, uh, seven, eight, nine. He, he did Ultima Nine, bless him. But yeah, Void Brand's really, really good. Uh, really quality content, and again, a really relaxed vibe for his channel as well. So check out Void Brand. Inglebard Gaming is really good. He does a lot of comparisons of different ports of games. So he'll look at like an arcade port and like a Sega Saturn port, for example. And I really like watching those videos. They're just he knows his stuff like technically and and like on the hardware side of things and then also they're just really relaxing to watch um, and he also does reviews and retrospectives he's doing a shining force retrospective right now and i love the shining force series it's like my favorite strategy rpg series i've been into those so he's really good bio phoenix has been a big supporter of the channel i think since like the lunacy video was the first time i saw him around in the comments and and he gave me a shout out back when and when i didn't have that many subscribers and it, and is always been pretty active in the comments section so i've watched a lot of his videos too he does he does like physical media pickups and like just looks at stuff he's recently gotten a hold of and he does game reviews and anime reviews and again just another chill time bio phoenix is good and then lastly i want to shout out soma spice i found him when i was doing the disillusion video because he was like one of the only people who'd also done a, a review on on disillusion and uh his video is really good and his most recent video i think at least at the time i'm recording this is on fear and hunger and it's a really good video and he does like 3d models and 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 graphics and stuff in his videos and it's just it's really entertaining so check him out as well so those are five smaller channels that i think are really great and i think are worth your time and have also like i said just been supportive of me in, in one way or another. So I really wanted to try to give back to them since my community has grown a lot recently. Next question. Out of all the game worlds you have covered so far, which one would you like to live in the most and which one would you like to live in the least? I would say the one I'd like to live in the most is Lunacy. Like Misty Town seems like a really cool place to live. Like I would really love to just walk those streets and just wander all around. Which one would I like to live in the least? Uh, probably, probably Blue Stinger because I don't want to live on Dinosaur Island and because the place is designed like a maze. It would be a nightmare. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to live on Dinosaur Island. Most surprising game discovery, like a game that looked interesting but turned out amazing. I think Broken, Broken Reality, I would point to that one of games that I've covered on the channel because I remember seeing that game a few years ago on Steam and thinking like, oh, that's kind of neat. Like, I like, you know, this could be cool. But then when I played the game, yeah, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, this is like, I thought it was just going to be a walking simulator, which again, like I said in the video, nothing wrong with that. But then it turned out to have like, you know, all these tools where you could like slingshot yourself and there's like some platforming and you've got to use your sword to cut down like viruses and stuff. And there it turned out to be this, this really amazing experience. So I think, I think, yeah, Broken Reality is is one of the games that, yeah, it looked interesting, and then I played it, and I was like, whoa, this is this is great. So if you haven't watched my Broken Reality video, uh, check that one out. Any games that you would absolutely not analyze on the show? I'd honestly like to see you tackle Baroque PS1. That game is dying for an in-depth analysis. Yeah, for sure. There's a ton. There's there's tons of games that I really love that I don't think would make a good video for the channel. Like I mentioned, the Shining Force series earlier. I love those games and I love to talk about them like with people when, you know, if, if ever strategy RPGs or stuff comes up in conversation, but I just don't think they would fit the vibe of the channel. So there's tons of stuff like that where games that I really love, but I'm not going to do a video on. And as far as Baroque, like, yeah, many people have, have requested Baroque. It's on the list. I'll get to it, but I'm probably going to do the Saturn version. Can we get a long version of your intro? Well, it's not my song, so I'd be hesitant to do that uh, on the channel, but it's called Copacabana Trap by Puda Beats. It's a license-free song that came with the original video editing software that I use. I used to use this thing, a free program called HitFilm Express, 
and it had a few songs that were just free to use. Now I use Premiere because I'm just more familiar with it and it's just better, but, uh, but it is expensive. But anyway, back to the song. Yeah, I mean, I just, I heard the first bit of it and then I just cut, you know, those first few seconds. I'm pretty sure it's just the intro of the song and I just cut the first few seconds and then put a reverb on the end and just fade it out. And that's what became the, the intro song. Copacabana Trap by Puda Beats. You can look it up. When playing or reviewing games, do you have a preference in graphical style? Like, for instance, do you like pixel slash low resolution art, or do you prefer things to have 3D graphics? Uh, I like both. I mean, it really depends on the game. Um, I think there's a lot of games with really great 2D or pixel art, and, and then there's a lot of games with really great 3D graphics. And for, for me, like, great 3D graphics are not the most realistic cutting edge stuff. Like I really like early 3D. I like the stuff where they're still experimenting and trying to figure out what they're actually doing. So yeah, I don't really put too much weight on, on graphics. It's all about whether it looks cool and that can be in any style. How do you write your scripts? Like, do you take notes while playing the games, format, etc.? I take notes while capturing gameplay footage, so I'll play through a game and I'll be taking notes. I use OBS to record and I always write down the timestamps. So, and I take notes on everything, like uh, just what's happening in the game, any random thought I have about the gameplay or what's what's going on, um, reactions to stuff that's happening in the game. Uh, yeah, and then I just write the timestamp for everything because that just makes it so much easier when I go to edit the video because I never know when I write the script what I'm gonna pull from from the notes. So having the timestamp where I can just go, oh, I'm talking about this, okay, it's here, put it in the video. That's incredibly useful. And then as far as the scripts go, you know, I used to do things very clearly, I used to have things very clearly segmented. In my earlier long videos, there used to be segments. And so I used to just write the scripts like that. But that became, and this is the reason I dropped those title cards and stuff and the musical kind of transitions is because that format started to feel too limiting to me. Like I just felt like, you know, I wanted to kind of more naturally go into different topics. So when it, whenever it came up, and I remember the moment that I felt that way was in the Blood Omen video because I was talking about the the HUD for that game, which and the UI, and it takes up a lot of space on screen. So I was like, okay, it's a presentation thing. But then everything I was talking about related to it was gameplay focused. So I was like, where do I put this thing? And I think it ended up in the gameplay section in the finished video. But after I made that video, I was like, maybe I need to rethink how I format things. And so then from that video on, I just kind of did a more kind of like freeform thing. But also I I think part of my process every single time is I start to get towards the end of a playthrough and I'm taking notes and everything and I start thinking about like, okay, I'm gonna have to write a script and make a video on this. And I just have a moment of just panic where I'm just like, I don't know what to say. I, I have not, I have no ideas. I, I, what, what am I doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> And that happens every time. So I've come to realize it's probably just part of the process. But yeah, I always get kind of freaked out um, right before I start writing the script. But then, you know, I'll start doing research like on the game's development and stuff and just see what I can find there. And I'll look over my notes again and I'll start pulling things out and then it starts to just come together. But I think the hardest thing to write for the scripts is the intro. You know, I want it to be something that catches your interest, keeps you watching. And um, I think I've gotten a bit better at it. One that I really am disappointed in and was the quality I think was reflected in the analytics was Kuon. Like that intro is like the worst thing I've ever written. It's so bad. I don't know what I was thinking. And I actually, the worst part is I had a different intro written for that script. Like I was gonna talk about From Software's PS2, you know, library and how diverse it was. But then I think when I, when I started to see how long the video was gonna be while I was writing, I was like, oh my God, this video is gonna be over an hour. Like I need to, I need to, you know, this intro needs to be snappier. Like I just need to get into the game. But in hindsight now, I don't think I really needed to do that. And then what I came up with, like I said, was just fucking awful. And and it showed like I, in the analytics, like so many, like that video got a lot of views. If you look at it, it's like almost, I think it's almost like 400,000 at this point. But if you look at the analytics, like 
only it only has like a 30 percent retention rate after the first 30 seconds which like that's what that's one of the things like goalposts like youtube sets up in the analytics as far as audience retention like the first 30 seconds and they say like 70 percent is a good uh thing to aim for for the first 30 seconds and most of my videos are within are in like 60 to 70 percent so it's pretty good but the, but the kuon video is like 30 percent it's it's awful and i know it's because of that introduction it's fucking terrible so anyone who made it past that and watched the, that video, thank you very much. You're you're very kind because I really hate that fucking introduction. That's like the one thing that I really I don't really have regrets about like anything I've done on the channel, even mistakes I've made. It's like whatever. I'm I'm only human. Of course I make mistakes, but that intro for the Kuon video is the one thing that I really regret doing. Fuck me. Thank you for your question. Next question, what is your process for making your videos funny? I know humor is subjective, but surely you have your own method of doing things. Yeah, I mean, I, I want the videos to be entertaining and I don't wanna take myself too seriously. So I often do make silly jokes and stuff. Some people like it. I, I think a lot of people like it. I mean, based on the feedback from the videos, but there's definitely people who don't like it and, uh, and they let me know, <laughs> don't worry. But I don't really give a shit what they think. But yeah, I, I mean, a lot of it, I think the funniest videos, like the ones people seem to really like and, and they always say like, oh man, this video cracked me up, is this those videos like basically write themselves because they're taken from reactions that I write in my notes while playing the game. Like those are, a lot of those jokes are like my honest reactions when I see things. Like I just write it down. I either say it out loud while I'm playing or I think it and I, I write it down and then I pull it out of the notes for the script. So I feel like those videos just, yeah, like I said, just they write themselves. And then, and I don't really try to put jokes into video. Like if it's not gonna fit, then it's not gonna fit. I'm not gonna try to shoehorn something in just to try to make it funny. Cause then it's not gonna be funny. Uh, and there's some videos that I don't really make really any jokes. Like again, going back to like the Kuon video, I don't, I don't think that's a particularly funny video. I think maybe there's a couple in there, but you know, it doesn't need to be funny. Uh, it just needs to be entertaining. But yeah, a lot of the comedy comes from just the game itself. It, it's, it feeds me these things, and I just react to it. <laughs> so, that's, uh, that's it. What tips do you have for making review slash showcase videos? I mean, one thing I would say is just like if you want to do this you should just do it. It doesn't matter if you don't know how to capture gameplay footage or you don't know how to edit a video or you don't know how to do a voiceover or whatever. You can look that stuff up. There's there's videos on YouTube explaining all of this stuff. So if you don't know how to do any of it, just the first thing you should do is invest some time into looking up tutorials and figuring out how to do it. And then just start doing it, just try. I, I really don't like YouTubers or other people on social media and stuff who, who try to like gatekeep this or act like it's some kind of like amazing thing. Like I've, I've seen a bunch of videos with more popular and bigger YouTubers than, than, than my channel saying things like, oh, being a YouTuber is so crazy. And like, I don't know, maybe it is if you're someone who has like millions of subscribers, uh, I don't have that experience. So I don't know, but I don't think it's anything I don't think doing this is anything out of the ordinary. Anyone can do this. Whether or not you're successful at it is another story, but anyone can do it. So if you want to do it, you should start doing it and you'll get better at it. Like you just keep doing it and don't pay attention to people who are just shitty. There's a lot of shitty people in the comments of YouTube and they don't matter. You need to be critical of the criticism that you receive. Some people do have really good tips and ideas and they're worth listening to if they present it to you in a way that's constructive and they're being cool about it. And I get a lot of people like that who've really helped me out with different stuff with all aspects of doing this. And they've given really good advice. And then there's people who just come in and, and they're just assholes and just shit on everything and, and are just they're hurling insults. I don't even read that shit. Like as soon as I start to see someone's cop in an attitude, I'm like, all right, fuck you. I don't care. Even if what you have to say is like good advice. You've code, you've covered it in shit. So I don't want to touch it. I don't want to get near it. <laughs> so like, you know, that's like a life lesson there. Like, don't be a fucking dick if you're trying to give people advice. But I mean, like, I don't know. There's people like that. And then there's just people who are just assholes. So whatever. But you know, yeah, like fuck those people. Like you don't, they don't matter. So 
listen to the people who are constructive and who are positive and uh and you'll get better at things you'll just you'll just learn how to do it and you'll gain more experience and more skills and eventually you'll be there so just do it that's my advice uh if you didn't end up doing dungeon chill what would you have done instead well i don't do this full time youtube's not a full time gig uh so if i wasn't doing this i'd probably be trying harder to find more freelance work which is what i do alongside youtube and then or i would have a full time job uh doing something like i'm a writer by profession i've worked in like marketing and stuff that's what i've done for the last uh a long time <laughs> and uh and uh yeah so i'd probably be doing something like that i mean that's the the realistic answer uh i'd like to know what the first game you ever played was even if it was at your uncle's house on his atari system what did you play and do you remember how you felt and also i'm curious to know what your first game console was and what was your favorite game in that console so the first game i ever played was super mario brothers uh, on the nes my grandfather had bought an nes for some reason i don't know why and we were all down in my grandparents' basement because it was furnished and they had, like my grandfather had like a little bar set up down there, which was really cool. He had like bar stools and everything. And uh, I was too young to appreciate it. Cause at the time, I, I mean, I was probably like two or three years old at the time. And I just remember it was like around, I think it was around Christmas time. And there was like my aunts and uncles, my parents, my grandparents. And we were all sitting in the basement, had the NES hooked up to the dial TV with the RF connection and playing Super Mario Brothers with my cousin. And um, I still remember getting the fire flower for the first time. And someone, someone in my family shouting out, don't use it too much or it'll run out. And for years after that, I thought that's how it worked. Like, uh, it was ridiculous. And I would tell friends like, oh, you can't use the fire flower too much, it'll run out. And like, finally, I think maybe a couple years later, <laughs> you know, some, one of my friends finally said to me like, what the fuck are you talking about? That's not how it works. And, and like my whole, I, you know, I just felt like my whole childhood was a lie. You know, uh, here I was at four years old, finding out that this thing I was told half a lifetime ago was, was wrong. I was just jaded from that point on. Started smoking cigarettes, you know. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, it was. It was a. Uh, that was a. That was a life-changing moment. Super Mario Brothers was my first game. NES was the first console I played. And then my favorite game on that console was. Ooh, picking a favorite anything is really tough for me. But I. I, I don't know. The one I played the most would probably be Super Mario Brothers three. So yeah, I think I'd go with that one. Going along those lines, which three games as a child or earlier in your life influenced your taste in video games the most? <laughs> Sorry, just kind of ran out of steam there. Uh, why and what aspects or traits of those games appealed to you? And what games or any other piece of media affected you most emotionally, whether it be through fear, sorrow, joy, etc.? So I think both of these questions will be answered by answering the first one. Going off of what I just said about my favorite NES game as a kid, Super Mario Brothers 3. Like, that game is so weird when you look at it. Like, it, it, it's just like, it takes place on a stage. Like, it, when the first thing that happens when you start that game is a curtain rises. And there's like, curtains at the side of the, of the stage that the game is set on. And that's just so weird. And then like the, the worlds themselves, they start off pretty simple, like grass world, desert world, but then you've got like giant world and pipe world and cloud world. Like everything was just so imaginative. And there's so many power ups in that game too. Some of them not even really useful, like, you know, or only useful in like one instance throughout the entire game, like the boot. I think there's only like a few levels where that's actually useful. So yeah, I think that game had a big impact on me because of just how weird it was. Um, and it's also, I think, one of the first games that I actually beat as well. And, and like the last world is like basically hell and there's like, you know, this, you're crossing those fire tiles and there's a chance that a hand will come up and drag you down. And, and like the first, I think it's the first level of World 8 with the tanks that you kind of have to jump across. Like, and it's just like a black background. It's so, it's so weird. And then this one, I think, will answer the second question. So the second game that affected me a lot was Final Fantasy VII. Uh, many people, I think, in my age have this have a similar experience with this game. It was just, I mean, if you weren't around at the time or you weren't into gaming at the time, 
you just don't understand how big of an impact that game had. Like everybody played that game. Even people, I remember kids who were just into sports games had a copy of Final Fantasy VII. Not all of them liked it, but there were some that like that turned them into RPG fans or like anime fans or something like, you know, it just like, it was, it was, it was just everywhere. And then actually playing the game. Spoilers, one of your party members dies about halfway through the game at the end of the first disc, which is yeah, about halfway through the game because the second and third discs aren't that long. It's not even the fact that a main character dies because that's happened before in other games. I think like Fantasy Star 4, one of the main characters dies and like Chrono, Chrono Trigger that happens. And so it's been done before, but the way they did it and the way that Eris's absence haunts the rest of the game, that was by design and they just nailed it. Like I remember as a kid, like if you're playing that game, you're probably going to, I know there's going to be people out there who are like, I had a date with Barrett actually the first time, but most people had the date with, with Eris when they first went to Gold Saucer. But then you go back to Gold Saucer in the second disc and it just feels weird being there without her. Like it's so bizarre and there's just this melancholy draped over the whole thing because you basically go on a date with Tifa then. It just... It doesn't feel like the fun, like, oh, kind of like exciting, kind of like I'm out with my crush kind of thing. Like even if Tifa was your crush, because you have this weight of Eris's absence on the moment. And it's in the dialogue between Cloud and Tifa in those scenes. So it's just such a, I don't know, it just affected me so much. And I remember when, like when you get the, the high wind, the airship in that game, you can fly back to the forbidden city or the forbidden capital, whatever it's called. And you can go all the way back to the place where Eris was killed. You can do that. And I did it as a kid and the whole time, like I didn't think there was any secret or anything down there. I just had this morbid curiosity to just go do it. And the whole time I just felt like it was something wrong. Like I shouldn't be doing this, but I did it anyway. I pressed on and I got all the way down there and there's nothing there. You can go all the way back to the spot where she was killed and there's nothing to do. You just gotta go back. And it was just such, I don't know, it just it was such an, uh, a feeling, you know? <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. But again, just this morbid kind of thing. And uh, I've never played another game that's made me feel that way. I'm sure other people have examples, um, but for me personally, I've just never played another game since then that's ever made me feel like that. And so despite what people say about the graphics or about the gameplay or the materia system or the fact that it's like, you know, one of the most basic Final Fantasies and the characters don't have classes and, you know, stuff like that. All the characters feel the same. None of that matters because of how that game made me feel. So that's why it will always be one of those games that I look at as like a very defining moment, not only in my like tastes in gaming, but also just in my life in general. It just, just it changed how I thought about storytelling, how I thought about characters, you know, how I thought about games. Like it was crazy. It was it was life changing for sure. And then the la the third one I would choose, which this may be a, a weird choice, but I would pick Shinobi on the PS2. And the reason for that is that was a game that I played when it came out and it was a very difficult game and not all of the difficulty is down to the gameplay. Some of it is technical, like the camera sucks in that game and some of the platforming is really ridiculous. But it was the first game, I, before before Shinobi, I had never really been interested in difficult games. Like I was never a good video game player as a kid. Like I always had friends who were like really good and we play like two player games like Streets of Rage and like Final Fight and stuff like this and I, or like Goemon and I'd always be the one who died first and would have to just sit and watch while my friend beat like beat the game or they got much further and then died and then we'd start over. But yeah, so I was never good at games when I was a kid. And uh, but then Shinobi came out and I was like in high school at the time. And I don't know something about that game. I just was like, I'm going to I'm going to master this fucking game. And I did. I <laughs> I beat it on every difficulty setting with every character. I got all those coins that you can collect, the Oboro clan coins. I did everything in that game. And I mastered it. And from that point on, I thought about difficulty in games differently. I was like, oh, if you just buckle down and like learn the game on its own terms, you can overcome the challenges. So a challenging game is only about how much time you want to invest 
into learning it. And so one, and, and that's what Shinobi did for me. It made me figure, it made me realize that. From that point on, like I went back and played a bunch of tougher games that I had like heard of or, or had played and given up on when I was younger. And then going forward, you know, after that, like Dark Souls came out and Demon Souls and everything. And I was like, oh, I love these guys. Like I get it. I understand how to play these games. So yeah, I would pick, I would pick those three. Here we have uh, a couple, que a few questions. Are there one or two there? There's two. If there are games you like but still didn't get translated to this day, which ones uh, would you like to be translated the most? Top five. Um, I don't think I can pick five <laughs> because I don't really know of five. A, a few I can think of off the top of my head though. One would be a game that I covered on this channel, Wackenroder for Saturn. That game has a partial translation to it and I would love to see that completed because that game's really interesting and I, I wanna know more about that world. Another one would be Linda Cubed, which came out originally on TurboGrafx CD and then it's got a PlayStation port, it's got a Saturn port. None of them are translated into English and I would really like to play that game. So I'd like to see that one translated as well. And then there's these detective adventure games on PS2, but they're called uh, Tante Jinguji Saburo. And the one on PS2 is called Innocent Black. And there's a bunch of games in that series. I'd like to see those translated at some point. Yeah, those are, there's, there's three. You could add in other games in the Tante Saburo series. So like, there you go. And then the second question, are you interested in lost media video games? And if so, do you have a favorite that still belongs to that category? These would be my questions for this q and I'm very new to this channel and I very much like you sharing with the world games that in the current age may be forgotten or not talked about as much while they're those hidden gems we needed. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, but yeah, are you interested in lost media video games? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to define lost media because especially with the internet, so many things are found and then you can actually experience them. So what is actually a lost piece of media? Like stuff that you can't play in any way, shape or form anymore. And uh, one that I've heard of, but I don't even know if it actually exists is I heard there was like a pseudo sequel to Cosmology of Kyoto called Cosmology of Asia. Uh, someone mentioned it in the comments uh, on the Cosmology of Kyoto video, and I think I would love to play that game. <laughs> so, but yeah, apparently it's it's lost. It doesn't it doesn't exist anymore. So, thank you for those questions. Next question: You've covered pretty esoteric titles, and even mentioned things like that Sega Saturn real estate tour. What makes you consider something a game? I mean, honestly, I don't really care, and that's not to like belittle your question or anything. I'm just answering honestly. Like, I just don't really care about that argument too much. I, I think if people want to discuss the criteria of what could be considered a game, I think that's fine, you know, whatever people want to do. But I'm not, I don't really care. Like, as far as the channel goes, I'm gonna cover whatever I want to talk about and whether someone else considers that a game or not is really no concern of mine. But yeah, this is a topic that people get pretty heated about. And I've seen in the comments, especially in my like point and click videos or adventure game videos, people are like, this isn't a game. And I'm always just thinking, you know, when I see stuff like that, I'm just like, okay, so, so what? So like, what's your point? <laughs> and, and I guess it's because in the video, I call it a game, but you know, what else am I supposed to say? This piece of interactive media? Like, I'm not gonna say that, I'm not a douchebag. You know, a game is just the easiest thing to call it. But yeah, I mean, my answer really is just, I, it doesn't matter to me whether something is a game or not based on some, you know, predetermined criteria. I think people get caught up in semantics and, and nitpicking stuff like this a bit too much. And then it takes away from these really interesting experiences that you can have through this medium of interactive media. <laughs> it's like, it's so, um, so yeah, I don't know. And I'm not, and, and, and to clarify, like I'm not saying that this, the person who asked this question is, is someone who thinks like that and I'm not directing any of this at them. I'm just answering the question honestly, so. So yeah, so uh, thank you for that question. Is there a game that made a big impact on you growing up that really disappointed you when going back to it? The first thing I can think of off the top of my head is Time Splitters. I forget if it's one or two. I think it's Time Splitters 2 because I played a lot of that game when I was younger and I really loved it. And I thought like it was such an amazing experience. And, and then a few years ago, 
I tried it out again. And and when the game was like loading up and stuff, I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember this first level with like the snow and, and like you got to go inside all these buildings and do stuff. And this game's like so fast paced and so smooth. And it's not any of those things. It's not fast paced. It's not smooth. It's GoldenEye gameplay, like where the crosshair like resets back to the center of the screen every time. And I was like, no, my God, I thought Time Splitters was so good. Like, and so, yeah, that was that was pretty disappointing. Another couple questions. What are some games with truly unique art styles, in your opinion? And what's the most esoteric, esoteric or abstract thing you've come across? I like stuff that really captures the atmosphere of eerie, foreign, alien world to me, especially with odd color palettes. Uh, there's a game that was recommended to me that I've checked out and that I'm going to make a video on very soon. It's called Vangers. So um, that game is such a trip. Like, and it has a very unique art style. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's one of the most unique ones. I think a unique art style is something that, at first, like on your first impression of it, is just kind of like, Ugh. <laughs> like, and then and then you look at it and you're like, wait a minute, okay, this is this is kind of neat. So, thanks for those questions. What piece of physical media that you own are you most proud of having been able to acquire? This is not game related, but there are a collection of like art books slash comics called Robot. The main artist that organized them is Yoshitoshi Abe, who is the character designer for stuff like Sp Serial Experiments Lane and, and Haibane Renmei. And there's 10 of them and they're all sci-fi stories dealing in some way with robots or artificial life. So um, it's a really interesting collection. Uh, a couple of the volumes were translated into English back in the early 2000s when they were released, but I have all the Japanese ones here and I got them quite, I, I think I got, got, got them all about 10 years ago at this point. Another thing that I just got like back at the time it was being released that I'm really glad that I still own are my copies of Electronic Gaming Monthly. I was a subscriber from 1998 till, till the end. I think I think they printed magazines until like 2009 or 2010, something like that. I'd have to check that. But I have everything from 1998 to, to whenever they finished uh, their last print copy. And I have a few copies from before that too, like earlier in the year of 98 and 97. So I'm really glad I have those as well. How old are you? Old enough to know not to answer that question. <laughs> no. I was born in the second half of the 80s. So I am very firmly a millennial. Uh, despite what some people have accused me of in some of my videos, there's been a few comments that have been that have said that I'm like a Zoomer. And you know what? If, if someone wants to think that I'm 15 plus years younger than I actually am, I'll take it as a compliment. So <laughs> thanks. Have you played Fear and Hunger? Yes. If you have, why haven't you made a video about it yet? Time. That game has a lot to it. I want to make sure that I give it the amount of time that it deserves to make a really good video about it and its sequel. So yeah, I'll get to it. It's on the list. What is horror? Listen, I am an American originally from the Philadelphia area, and we have a very particular way of speaking. So if you just don't like it, I'm a sick gritty on you. What's a game you didn't expect to enjoy, but ended up liking? From the channel, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Uh, I saw that game and I thought it was like one of those games that would just come in a cereal box and just be like this tie-in thing and it's just like whatever, but it turned out to be like a really good adventure game with a lot of extra stuff to it. There's a lot of things in that game that I didn't talk about in the video that just like you can just run across and things will randomly trigger and occur while you're, while you're playing. There's a lot more beyond just the main path of the story and so yeah I, I ended up really enjoying that game and I didn't expect to. Like you I love a bit of bad voice acting. What's the best worst voice acting in a game you've ever heard or what's your favorite quote badly executed in a game and uh, also I heard you like some good old bad voice acting which of such performance do you like the most? <laughs> My favorite the thing that makes me laugh the most is in a game that I haven't covered. It's in a game called Destrega for the PS1, and I actually saw it on a Thor High Heels video, and it's this. And the villagers? Why did you kill them? For harboring you. It is a crime punishable by death. Ah! <laughs> I just love that so much. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's my favorite. 
Did you grow up with Saturn games and return to them for nostalgia, or was this more a discovery in later years of your life? Your videos made me remember how much I missed the graphics of that time. Uh, the Saturn was around when I was a kid, and I remember playing a demo of Nights into Dreams in a Toys R Us, and really being amazed by it and blown away and, and wanting a Saturn for a time. I eventually ended up with a PS1, which was in hindsight the better choice because I think the PS1, as despite how much I love the Saturn's library, the PS1 has a stronger library. But yeah, I was always fascinated with it and I had a Genesis or a Mega Drive. Again, depending on what side of the pond you're on. Uh, I had a Genesis growing up, and um, so I was into Sega. And so at first it made sense, like, oh, of course I'm going to get a Saturn. But then, yeah, then I saw the PlayStation, and I was like, whoa. And that was it. But I acquired a Saturn uh, a little bit later. It was like, uh, I think in 2005 was around the time I got the Saturn, because a friend of mine was selling his. And he had some good games. He had Magic Knight Rare Earth, which is a very rare game. And it's like a pretty, it's a pretty good game too. I really liked that game. So yeah, and then I, you know, once I got the Saturn, I got like Knights into Dreams and Burning Rangers and, you know, all this stuff. And at the time, you know, well, the Saturn game, all, most Saturn games were pretty cheap, except for Panzer Dragoon Saga. But yeah, I got into Saturn around that point, And I've just always loved the system. And I really want to get a modded one with like the optical drive emulator in it because the Saturn I had the the disk drive went and that seems to be a common problem with them the disk drives were not very good so I'd love to get one with a an optical drive emulator and yeah just go go ham but those are expensive and I don't know how to mod on my own so I'd need to pay someone to do it so and but yeah I love the Saturn and I have a quite a few other games on the Saturn that I'd like to cover on the channel. What's your favorite Pop-Tart flavor? Raspberry. Why are you so chill? Why are you so dungeon? I don't know, man. It's just how it be. Do you have any pets? Yes. So I'm a, I'm a dog person. I have a six-year-old Shih Tzu. Uh, her name is Zoe. She often uh, wanders around while I'm recording voiceovers. She's actually pretty quiet today. I don't, I don't I think she's out in the living room and I'm in my office, but um, she usually wanders around on the hardwood floors with her little claws clicking and clacking while I'm trying to record and I often have to stop and then she'll like dig at the floor or she'll try to jump up in the chair I'm sitting in while I'm recording and you know like I record voiceovers and stuff when I'm home alone and I think she just thinks like who are you talking to you're not talking to me so what are you doing and I think she gets really annoyed by it <laughs> so so yeah I'm sure I couldn't point you to any moment specifically, but I'm sure somewhere in my videos you could probably hear her walking or scratching in the background of me talking in, in somewhere, so, yeah. What's your record for most time chilling in a dungeon? Pfft, record? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm there right now. It's lifetime, baby. Have you ever played Xenogears? If so, what were your thoughts? Um, I have tried to play Xenogears many times, uh, ever since, I think it was with Parasite Eve, it came with a demo disc of Xenogears, and I I played that demo disc over and over when I was younger, and then I tr I bought it on, the, on PSN, and I started that game probably about five or six times, and I could never get very far in it. I don't know why. I, I think it's a really cool game, and I'm very interested in the story and the setting and everything, but I, for some reason, just cannot remain invested in it every time I start it. We also have read any good books you'd recommend lately. These are not books that I've read lately. Uh, lately, I've been reading a bunch of classics that I haven't just gotten around to like Dune. I read Dune recently. I've read uh, for Halloween. I read Frankenstein, which I'd never read before, and that was really cool. But for books that I'd recommend, I have three. So I I do really like to read. So the first one I'd recommend is The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, which is about these two monks in like 11th or 12th century uh, Europe. I think it's set in Italy. I want to say, but I can't quite remember. Like I said, it's been a it's been a few years since I last read it. But they go to an abbey in the countryside to investigate a murder of another monk. And when they get there, they find out he fell from this tower that has a library up at the top of it. But only the librarian and his assistant are allowed in the tower. But this guy, this other monk who fell, fell from one of the library windows. And and they're not allowed to enter the library. Like, they won't let them do it. So, so they're investigating this murder, they're talking to all the people at the abbey. 
they end up sneaking into the library and it turns out to be laid out like a labyrinth with like traps and stuff inside. And it's really cool. It's really surreal. It's a great book. So The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. The next book I would recommend is If on a Winter's Night a Traveler by Italo Calvino, which is this weird like meta narrative. And it's about like all the odd numbered chapters are about a reader and it's written in second person. So it's like you sit down to open the book and you recline in your chair and, and stuff like that. And it's about a reader who bought a copy of If on a Winter's Night a Traveler and they're trying to read it. And then all the even numbered chapters are first chapters of different books. So the reader starts to read If on a Winter's Night a Traveler and the first chapter ends and then there's nothing else in the book. So he thinks it's like, a binding mistake and so he goes back to the bookshop and gets a replacement and then, and then in chapter four he starts reading again and it turns out to be a completely different book and then he finds uh, someone else that this happened to and they and eventually it starts to uncover this like book binding conspiracy with like these dead languages and and he's reading all these first chapters of different books and then getting interested in those and wanting to find out where the rest of those books are and it goes on like that and it's really cool has a really surreal again another really surreal atmosphere uh it's great so if on a winter's night a traveler and then the last one i'd recommend is einstein's dreams by alan lightman and um it's a fictional dream diary of Einstein's as he was figuring out the theory of relativity. So all of the dreams are of these worlds where time flows in different ways than our own. So some of the like time flows more slowly. So everything moves in slow motion. Everything's in like a red light. So it's kind of like being on the edge of a black hole. And then there's another one where time moves cyclically per day. So, you know, stuff like that. But then it starts to get like really out there. So Einstein's dreams is a good one too. So those are three books I'd recommend. Do you have a boyfriend? No. I don't. Best and worst game of the year you played? I haven't played, I don't think, any games that have come out this year. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, if it's not something I've covered on the channel, then I really haven't played much outside of that. Because, yeah, which is disappointing, because there were a lot of games I was looking forward to this year, like uh, Baldur's Gate 3 and Armored Core 6, and I haven't played any of them. I haven't even bought any of them. I hope that next year I will have more time to play newer releases because I think now that I figured out the workflow for videos and stuff, I will have more time. I guess of the games I played that came out this year, I mean Lunacid or Lunacid as some people have told me it's supposed to be pronounced because of Lunatic, Lunacid, but I think Lunacid sounds way more badass so I'm just going to keep calling it that. But that game was great and that came out this year so that was really good. Hopefully next year I can have something else more to say about that. What classic mid-2000s era game do you wish was rebooted or get a sequel today? My personal answer would be Jack and Daxter. I had so many good memories of playing Jack 3 and slowly going backwards and completing the rest. This is a series that started in the 90s, but it did have a sequel in the 2000s, and this is like the last we've ever seen of it. Uh, but Panzer Dragoon. I would love to see another Panzer Dragoon game because I love Panzer Dragoon Orta, a sequel to Orta. That would be great. So that's my choice. Have you ever wanted to make a game? If so, what kind of mechanics would you like to incorporate? I'd never seriously wanted to make a game. Um, I've had ideas about what would be a cool game, but I never thought like, I'm gonna learn game dev and, and try to make it a reality. But a mechanic that I would like to see incorporated would be the battle system from like Parasite Eve and Vagrant Story. I love that sphere grid battle system where you can target enemies or in Vagrant Story target different limbs of enemies. I think that's such a great battle system and it's so underutilized. Like it's basically like, I've only seen it in those two games. And I'd, I'd just really like to see another game use that, that style. Do you like indie games? Do you think indie games are better than AAA games these days? Yes, I do like indie games. As far as if I think they're better, I'm not gonna discriminate a game based on who developed or published it. But I will say that in the last few years, Pretty much all AAA games that I've tried have not held my interest. Like, I don't think they're good <laughs> at all. Like, the last one I played was Starfield, and I just thought it was so boring. Like, I, and I was excited for Starfield because I like space RPG. That sounds awesome. I love Star Control 2. I think Star Control 2 is a way better game than Starfield. But, uh, yeah, and I don't even think Starfield is a bad game. I just think it's incredibly boring. I think they, they had this space-faring humanity setting, and they just chose the most boring way to present it. But then there's tons of interesting games that I'm excited for and that I've actually played and have been amazing. So so yeah, I think indie games are in a better place quality wise than AAA games for the most part. What's your personal favorite indie game? 
My favorite indie game is Hyper Light Drifter. Uh, it's one of my favorite games of all time. I love the gameplay, I love the story, love the combat, love the movement, uh, the atmosphere, everything. The music, of course, uh, disaster piece, like, uh, it's great. I, I, I love that game. I actually, that, I learned to speed run it a few years ago. <laughs> and like, uh, and so I have played through that game many, many, many times. Did any children's games scare the crap out of you when you were a kid? I slept on an air mattress in my parents' room sometimes due to nightmares about the Clue Finders, Jumpstart 4th Grade, and the Manhole Masterpiece Edition. Uh, more than pure horror, I found surrealism super eerie and tonally ambiguous as a kid. It creeped me the hell out. Yeah, for sure. Like, I agree with all of that. I think surrealism can be more creepy and tonally ambiguous. Not even as a kid. Like, even now I feel that way. I think that some games that focus more heavily on atmosphere and just being surreal can be scarier than just like a pure, you know, kind of traditional horror game. And as far as any children's games that scared me, we had a Sega Pico when we when we were kids, my sisters and I. And um, I don't know how many people remember that thing, but look it up, Sega Pico, P-I-C-O. And um, there was a game on it for the busy world of Richard Scary. And I love Busy World of Richard Scary. In fact, I have a DVD set with every episode of the Richard, the Richard World of Scary Busy. The Busy World of Richard Scary. And uh, <laughs> I don't know why. I think I was like high and I ordered it one time. But um, fucking love it. But anyway, there was a game on Sega Pico based on that show and book series. And um, it's if you looked at it, it's not creepy or scary in any way, but I just remember as a kid, it was like really kind of unsettling. Like, I don't know, there wasn't a lot of music. And uh, I remember there was like a driving section. It's mostly like educational games, but there was like this driving section where you could drive around busy town. And I don't know, I liked to play that game, but there was also, like I said, something just kind of off-putting about it. So that was, that was something. What's your favorite dungeon to chill in? I like, Arx Fatalis. Like, I like the the fact that the city is underground, like Ultima Underworld, and it's got these different societies and different levels of it. And so I, I really like that world. And, and the whole world is a dungeon. So that's pretty neat. Ozzy or Dio? That's a tough one. I mean, you know, Black Sabbath era Ozzy, you can't really beat. But then, you know, there's Heaven and Hell for Dio. That's a great album. Uh, and his solo holy diver come on <laughs> i mean but then ozzy has a really good solo career as well so i think i'd have to go with ozzy you have a visual aesthetic and a name that kind of guarantees that we've got at least a little bit of overlapping taste in music so i'm curious what are some of your favorite artists and are there any in particular that you'd say might inform your channel's vibe that you'd want to mention i'm kind of all over the map with music i really like listening to music but my tastes change monthly like recently i've been listening to a lot of like fiona apple and uh, I was also listening to, well, hold on, let me check my Spotify. What have I been listening to? Let's, let's check my searches. So, like, here's my recent searches on Spotify. I've got uh, The Cure, Deftones, Sun O, or however you are supposed to pronounce their name, Boris, Bjork, White Zombie, AFI, only early, A, like, pre-Art of Drowning, Drutk, Dr I don't even know how to pronounce this band's name, actually, uh, Drutk, Druk, which is a Ukrainian black metal band. The White Stripes, Bob Dylan, Fiona Apple, uh, Sonic Youth, Boa, which is the, not the Korean, not the K-pop artist, the, the, the English band who did the theme song to Serial Experiments Lane. And then I have the Foo Fighters on here. <laughs> so like, a, um, so yeah, I'm kind of just all over. But I also like a lot of EDM. I like Vaporwave, FM Skyline is my favorite Vaporwave artist. Uh, I have a small collection of vinyl. Most of it is black metal. Like I have dark, a bunch of Dark Throne albums and Emperor, Carpathian Forest, Bathory. Uh, what else is over there? Celtic Frost. And then I've got like some Cure albums and I've got Deltron 3030. You know, Del the Funky Homo Sapien, Dan the Automator and Kid Koala. It's a great album. Yeah, so it's just all over, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's all over. And I don't know, I pick a lot of stuff. The stuff that's not from games that I play on the channel is from the YouTube audio library. And I usually look for stuff that says like atmospheric or, or 
ambient and stuff like that and I just find or dark and I just find stuff that sounds cool and there's actually a lot of good stuff on the YouTube auto audio library if you uh, if you dig deep enough so yeah gay son or thought daughter I don't really understand the premise of this question because I mean if we're looking at if we're looking at thought from like the standard definition which is a derogatory thing it's like something you don't really want to be but then like gay is not being gay is not derogatory so gay son what's your favorite bad game by that i mean one that's unquestionably of poor quality but you find it endearing or at least amusing in its low quality and what's a game that had a good concept but bad execution that you really liked i think these two questions are related it's difficult for me to answer this because i feel like just because a game has like one bad quality to it doesn't mean that the game is worthless like there could be other things about it that are just really that are really great and I think there's so many examples of that on the channel pretty much a lot of the things that I cover are, would fit those those uh, that criteria it's like the gameplay is not good or the controls aren't that great but all of this is amazing so or at least it's it's fun to talk about and then if you don't mind a second question what is your PFP it is Lord Pokiel of Legend of Mana he is the dream teller, the poet of truth. And do I think of myself as a dream teller, a poet of truth? I don't know. I don't think so. But <laughs> yeah. but that's the profile pic I've chosen because I think he's a cool dude. Do you speak Japanese or any other languages or just know a little bit? Also, oh, okay, hold on. There's like three questions here. So, um, or two really. Uh, do you speak Japanese? Yes. And it's because I live in Japan, which is in, which I mean, you know, if you look at the about page on the YouTube, my region is Japan. So yeah, I live in Japan. I've lived in Japan for like uh, over 10 years. So I speak Japanese pretty well. I, I mean, I can do like daily conversation and, and talk to people, but there's certain things that are still difficult. Japanese is very different from English. So it's tough to get by in certain situations. Like there's a lot of like paperwork stuff you have to do here. They love paperwork in Japan, so that stuff can be tough, like going to City Hall and doing certain things. And I can read quite a bit of Japanese, but I'm not a translator. So like, I would love to be able to cover games. Like someone asked earlier about games that haven't gotten translations. I would love to be able to cover more games like that and talk about them, but the problem is, like I could sit down and play a game like that and read it and be able to at least understand the gist of conversations and stuff in my head, probably get a fair bit of the details as well. But then to regurgitate that in English would be extremely difficult. I mean, any translation is tough, but Japanese to English is, is especially difficult because you have to transliterate in a lot of situations. I've seen people argue about like Japanese translations and be like, I just want a direct translation. No, you don't, because it's going to be really dry. Japanese is really dry. It's not dry in Japanese. There's a lot of nuance to the way things are said and what kanji is used and stuff like that. But to translate it just directly into English, it's not that good. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't, it lacks a lot of, a lot of the flavor that you can add in English. So yeah, translation's hard. So there's a lot of games that I'd like to cover that I have the ability to play and understand, but they're just tough to kind of talk about. Also, if you are willing to share, what is your first name? Uh, I'm not willing to share. So Dungeon Chill or Chill or DC or any of the things, Sir Chills a lot, you know, maybe that'll catch on. <laughs> any of those things are, are good. So yeah, I just don't think it's really necessary to, to know my name for the channel. So yeah, but thanks for the questions. How you going, mate? Life treating you well? Uh, yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, I can't complain. Things have been up and down this year, but you know, I'm still, still got a place to live, still got a job doing things and family and friends. So things are good. How are you doing? How's everyone doing? I hope everyone's doing well. Where's the beef? In my stomach because I had Burger King for lunch. Favorite penguin from Madagascar? Uh, the, the black and white one. I've never seen any of the Madagascar movies. When is my dad coming home? He's right behind you. If you were a sandwich, what kind of sandwich would you be? Uh, probably a Philly cheesesteak, so I could throw myself in the face of that person who made fun of the way I say horror. <laughs> no, I'm just, just kidding. I love you. Um, 
But yeah, that eh, Philly cheesesteak, we'll go with that. Oh boy, here's some good ones. What are your top five games, top five recommendations? What's your favorite PS1 game? What's your top five games of all time for you personally? Favorite game per console? My God, you guys are ambitious. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. So, uh, <laughs> like, uh, I'll try to answer top five games and then it'll cover some of the others. I guess the first one I would pick would be Super Metroid. I love Super Metroid. Um, I've played that game a lot. I've tried to speedrun it, never successfully completed a speedrun, but I have learned some speedrun tricks like Crade Kill and Mock Ball and um, Alcatraz Escape and stuff like that. So, so Super Metroid for sure. And I've played a lot of like Super Metroid ROM hacks and stuff that are really fun. These picks are going to be like really vanilla compared to the stuff I cover on my channel. Legend of Mana, because, you know, my, my profile pick is Pokeel but I, I just really like that game. I like its atmosphere. I like how weird it is. I like that you're not even really the main character of that game. There's other characters that the story revolves around and you're just kind of like a guy or a girl you can choose. You're just an adventurer who just goes around getting involved in these other people's, <clears throat> you know, like world changing things that are happening to them. <laughs> so I don't know. And I really like the art style too. I love that like hand, like the, the um, water, color kind of hand-drawn look of the backgrounds and the sprites and stuff like that um how many did i do i only did two so far uh <laughs> shit um kingsfield 4 that's like my favorite ps2 game love that game i think it's just incredible like the first time i played it i was just so drawn into that world and just so amazed by it sekiro i mean it's another from soft game but that is i love japanese folklore and, and horror and that game has that in spades and it just has an amazing combat system. It's my favorite FromSoft game of the Miyazaki games. Like I, th I think it's their masterpiece. I know lots of people would choose something else like Elden Ring or something, but I really love Sekiro. How many is that? That's four. Two, I need to choose one more. Prey 2017. That game is amazing. One of the best immersive Sims I've played. So yeah, there's my five games for now. I mean, again, I'm very bad at choosing favorites. So that uh, if you ask me this question again, whenever we do another <laughs> Q and A, the, the, all of those choices could change. What's your favorite game soundtrack? Favorite OST. Also, what's your favorite music? Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay. What's your favorite game soundtrack? Favorite OST. That would be, I, the one I've listened to the most is probably Chrono Cross. I mean, I think Chrono Cross is an amazing game. I like, I prefer Chrono, Chrono Trigger as a game, but Chrono Cross is still really good. And I have a lot of memories from playing that game, similar to Final Fantasy VII, just, it made me feel things. And, and the soundtrack is incredible. So I would probably choose Chrono Cross. And then what's your favorite music not from a video game that still still gives off the vibe of chilling in a dungeon? There's a lot of dungeon synth. So if you look up dungeon synth artists, you'll find people like Depressive Silence. Uh, Bitterzum did a lot of, uh, especially later on, did some synth stuff. I think their last album, which was called like Thulian Mysteries, I think. I forget what the name of that album was. Let's see. Th yeah, Thulian Mysteries. Um, that album is very dungeon synth. Uh, it was, I mean, he made it as a soundtrack to his, I think, D&D &D sessions or some kind of tabletop RPG session. So yeah, stuff like that is tailor-made for chilling in a dungeon. Are you a virgin? No. Do chickens have telepathy? Yeah, I think so. I mean, how else would they have crossed the road? They have eyes on both sides of their head, but I don't think that's enough. I really like the video game content on your channel. Thank you. I especially appreciate your longer, more in-depth videos. I'm curious if you would give your thoughts on other media as well, like film, novels, music, etc. Namely, the graphic novel Vermis by an artist that goes by Plas Plastibu. Sorry to add something to the list. I don't think that I would cover any other media unless it was related to a video game. So, like I did with LSD and the, and the Dream Diary. Yeah, I'm just not... I'm not as interested in talking about that stuff, at least in a video. And uh, and yeah, so, and also this channel has been, this channel was created as a gaming channel. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna confuse the algorithm and start throwing out different stuff. So, but you know, that's kind of secondary. The most important thing is I just don't have as much interest in writing scripts and making videos about other stuff besides video games, so. 
yeah, sorry. And uh, I, I'll look into I'll look into uh, Vermis uh, and Plastibu. I've never heard of it, so I'll check it out. Thank you. I just wanted to say thanks for making a video for my suggestion, Plague of the Moon. I'd like to ask, what's your favorite kind of gaming genre? Yeah, Jan Pyres here suggested Plague of the Moon very early on, and uh, I tried it out and was like, yes, this is a video, and I made it. If, if some of you are jealous that I haven't made your suggestions yet, I'm getting, I'll get to them. Don't worry, just hold on. Please be patient. I'm only one person, and there's a lot of games that I have on my list that I want to cover, so I'll mix it in. Next year's a new year, we'll get to it. My favorite gaming genre is RPG. Uh, both Western RPGs and JRPGs. I like stats, I like numbers, I like going on big adventures. Doesn't matter the setting, fantasy, sci-fi, modern world. I like that shit. So, um, RPGs are my favorite. I haven't covered many RPGs on the channel yet, again, because of time. Uh, and do you like any of the old Sierra adventure games? Leisure Suit Larry, Space Quest, etc. Yeah, I mean, I like, I played King's Quest and those are fun. And I played Shivers, those are good ones. But other than that, I mean, I think I played a couple others, but the most, I haven't really played, I haven't played Leisure Suit Larry or Space Quest. Hopefully someday I can get around to trying them out. Life is too short for all the games that I need to play. Were there games that made you feel sick in the stomach and couldn't finish? If so, can you name them? By the way, I am newish, love your content, just want to put that out there. Thank you. Yeah, for sure, one I can think of right off the top of my head, Deadly Premonition. I will never make a video on that game because I hate the combat in that game, and it literally makes me feel sick to my stomach to play that game. I love everything else about that game, the story, the setting, the atmosphere, the characters, even even driving around with the janky driving mechanics and like having to refuel your car, running out of gas in the middle of nowhere and having to run back to town. <laughs> like. <laughs> Um, that's happened while I've played that game. It's all incredible, but oh my God, the combat just kill me. I hate it. I hate it so much and I hate quick time events and that game, when you run into the raincoat killer and you got to do those quick time events where you're, you're being chased or hiding in lockers. Oh God, I fucking hate it. So yeah, Deadly Premonition, that's my choice. Are there any games that make you stop and say, I can't believe this is running on X platform. The graphics in Taromaru threw me and I thought it must have come out several years after when it really did. I mean, I think I used to feel that way, but not really anymore because, you know, now I play stuff on PC and like I've seen a bunch of the console generations and kind of what they're capable of. And some stuff is really impressive. I think stuff from like late era PS1 and like Saturn, like you said, is good. Like Vagrant Story is a game that's just like, ugh. <laughs> like the lighting effects that they baked in in that game because they didn't have a lighting system <laughs> really those are yeah, those are great so yeah stuff like that is pretty impressive alternate question i've recently discovered some neat ports of modernish games on comparably ancient hardware has this ever interested you like playing quake on the gba etc i think that stuff is really neat and i like watching videos on stuff like that but actually playing those things eh, like i think it's a novelty and it's like cool to try out if you can but i'm not gonna sit and play all of quake on a gba so yeah i think it's a cool novelty but but my interest stops at just watching people talk about them and watching videos on it. Best sewer dungeon. Mm, I'm kind of particular to the Rabinaster sewers in Final Fantasy XII. Like they were that was like finding all the sluice gates and stuff. It wasn't too bad. And I really liked the combat in XII. So it didn't really matter where I was. That, that system was fun. I liked setting up gambits and stuff. What are your top three trees in video games? Well, that one tree uh, in front of Peach's Castle in Mario 64. That, that's a good tree. Those trees in Dark Souls 1 with the little roots moving and it looks like little feet and you, you can kill them and find secret areas. I mean, that, that, those, that's a good tree. In, uh, oh, in NES Open, when you hit your ball out of bounds into the trees and then you gotta, there's always that one tree in the way of your shot. That's a good tree. Which game would you never touch again and which can you still enjoy even years later? Game I would never touch again, Enemy Zero. <laughs> it's like, I know I'm gonna piss off the Enemy Zero fans, but I played that game 
I am glad I did. It was an experience and it made for a very good video, uh, but I never want to play it again. It was a nightmare. And when I said in the video that I wanted to give up and cry in a corner, that actually happened. Like, well, not, <laughs> not, not literally, but like I, <laughs> well, maybe it did. I don't know, whatever. Um, but yeah, there, that part that I talk about where you have to go down, like it's near the end of the game and you have to go down through different levels and there's no map and your gun is running out of charges because it's before you pick up the last gun that has unlimited charges. And then there's just enemies everywhere and you don't know where you're going. I, I died so many times and I just had to stop playing. I remember I just stopped playing the game and I, I was like, maybe I, I thought to myself, like, maybe I, I don't need to finish this. Maybe I have enough footage to make a video. But then the next day I was like, no, I have to finish it. Like, what's the point of making a video about it if I don't finish it? So I did, and I'm and like I said, I'm glad I did, but yeah, I never want to play it again. <laughs> Uh, which can you still enjoy even years later? Tons. Like, there's too many to name. Like, there's so many old games that I played when I was younger that I still go back to, and I'm just like, this is amazing. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of games like that. What video game cliche is your least favorite? I'm, I'm guessing that talking about cliches, maybe you're talking about gameplay mechanics, and for that, I would say... Uh, quick time events, fucking hate them. Uh, the early, the late 2000s, early 2010s, where quick time events were in like everything was just the worst. <laughs> I hate it. How do you feel about cinematic adaptations of video games? Well, I think for a long time they were really terrible, but I guess they're getting better. I haven't seen any, I haven't seen the Sonic movies. I haven't seen the Mario movies. I don't know what else they've made recently. I know they've made a few others, but I, yeah, I guess I just have no opinion. I have two. Do you reckon the artificial scarcity of retro gaming libraries drummed up by companies regarding the Saturn, for example, is a way of maintaining control of consumer interests? They could make a lot of money preserving old games and making them available to those curious, but if they did, then they'd risk losing interest in their shiny new stuff. In their mind, at least. Um, I don't think it's quite as nefarious as that. I think that the people that are high up in these companies that are in charge of making the business decisions, all they care about is the bottom line. All they care about is profit. Like, I think there is a very large, there's definitely a very large community of people who would be interested in buying retro re-releases of lesser known games. Because, you know, these companies, like, they're always going to re-release their popular titles. And, you know, same with Capcom. Mega Man's going to be re-released till the end of time, which is great. But their lesser known stuff, maybe not so much. I mean, for example, there was the Onimusha remake or remaster that came out a few years ago and Capcom had plans in the beginning to redo, remaster Onimusha 2 and 3 as well. Um, I don't know about Dawn of Dreams. I think it was just the first three. But because the first game released and didn't sell very well, they scrapped the whole thing. And now we're not gonna get remasters of two and three, unfortunately, because two is my favorite. So I was really disappointed. And I bought the first Onimusha remake because I really like that game. That's definitely a series I want to cover at some point. But yeah, I, I think it's just down to to profit and and them not wanting to take risks. Because especially, and especially with the Saturn, like if you're talking about Sega and the Saturn, like they got burned pretty badly by the Saturn at least in North America, that's not the, that's not the system's fault. It's Sega of America's fault and their mishandling of, of many things during that era. And also a lot of infighting between the Japanese side and the Western side. So there's that too, but, but still like, I, I'm sure they, anyone who is working at Sega and looking at the Saturn, they're just like, no, nah, not with that. And like, you know, Yuji Naka had enough clout at the time before he got you know, sent away. You know, he had enough clout to say like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to remaster Knights and re-release it. And Sega was just like, yeah, all right. <laughs> okay, you no. Know. Because he was, he had enough clout to do that. But for lesser known games, yeah, it's tough. That's a tough sell, unfortunately. I would love to see like a series of like Saturn re-releases or like collections of older series and stuff. But yeah, I just don't think it's going to happen. And I think it's just down to, to profit. Two, you played the Fear Effect games. Uh, question mark? Yeah. You played the Fear Effect games? I think they'd be up your street. The first anyway. I think I rented the first one when I was younger, when it first came out. I don't really remember it much, but yeah, that'd be something that could definitely, I think, be covered on the channel. I'd have to go back and retry it and see, but yeah. 
What non-game do you think has had the biggest impact on these kinds of games? Uh, these, by these kinds of games, I'm guessing you're talking about stuff that I've covered on the channel. And I think at least looking into the development history of a lot of these games, a lot of game developers were inspired by movies. So I think a lot of movies had a big impact on, on many games. Are there any other media, books, movies, etc., that might have influenced your taste in games? I don't know if those interests influenced my taste in games. I think everything is kind of together. Like, the things that I'm interested in, I'm interested in across different media. I like stuff that is maybe a bit difficult to, like, get into at first. I like kind of putting in the work to figure things out. I like stuff that doesn't hold your hand. Um, and that relates to everything. Books, music, movies, video games. So I think across all media, I have those kinds of tastes. Who killed JFK? America's fear of itself killed JFK. How tall am I? Five foot nine. What are your thoughts on the Megami Tensei series, specifically the SNES to PS1 era? And have you played any of the older Megami Tensei games? If so, what are your thoughts? I get questions about SMT very often <laughs> in the comments. Uh, this, these two are referring to the original series, but maybe they mean SMT because that's the more popular one. But, um, oh, I'm gonna piss off an entire fan base, aren't I? Um, <laughs> I, I like the concept of the SMT games, but I don't enjoy playing them. And it's not that I think that they're bad games. Uh, I've played the first one on Super Nintendo, and I've played, I tried out the second one a bit just to see what it what was like, but I didn't really play it. The third one I've played, the fourth one I've played, and the fifth one I own on Switch, and I played a bit of it, but I got bored with it because I don't like that it's just basically all overworld. You're just in a desert the whole time. And I, got, I just got really bored. But my problem with the SMT series is the fact that I, while I love RPGs, I like having a set party and just using that party and growing and, and improving them throughout the course of the game and having the same set characters. But in, in SMT games, in many of the SMT games, you have this rotating cast of demons that you're constantly cycling in or you're you know evolving them or combining them or whatever you do. And, and then they become new characters basically. And I, yeah, I get that you're building upon, you know, weaker, weaker demons to create stronger ones. And there's a progression there, but it just doesn't, work for me. It doesn't hold my interest. So while I think the SMT games like st are stylish and I like the setting, I like the concept, I like even the minimalist storytelling in a lot of the games, especially in the mainline series, but I don't know. They just don't they just don't hold my interest because of that reason. I like just being able to have the same party members either being given to you or creating them and then just going from there for the for the entire game. So that's my main the main reason I don't like the, I'm not, it's, I'm not going to say I don't like them. Uh, this main reason I'm not, I can't get into them and I've tried many of them. So not just the ones I mentioned, the mainline SMT games, but other side games as well. I've tried and I just, I think they're cool, but I can't, my interest wanes quickly. I will say I do love the Raido Kuzunoha games and I have them on my list to cover. Uh, the PS2 action RPG ones. I, I like those games a lot. Uh, so there you go. I'll throw you that bone. What's the most important aspect of a game to you? And what's the most important thing from a game for you? Story, gameplay, characters? My favorite aspect of gameplay is exploration, which I mentioned near the end of the Blue Stinger video. I love exploring. So if a game lets me just go off and explore things, it doesn't even matter if it's like kind of linear. It doesn't have to be like an open world game. I'm actually not that interested in open world games because I feel like it's too much. Like there's, it becomes overwhelming in a lot of them. There are some that I really like, but in a lot of them it becomes overwhelming and the tasks become very boring and samey. That's a problem with open world design, which has been sort of fixed in newer games like in, um, you know, Breath of the Wild and Elden Ring. And I'm, I'm assuming Tears of the Kingdom, again, I haven't played it because I haven't played any new, really new games from this year. But yeah, exploration is my favorite thing. I like exploring. And what's your favorite game's ending? Um, my, the most memorable ending that I've ever played in a game. And again, this is gonna go against like some of the stuff I just said about AAA games and also open world games, but I love Red Dead Redemption, the first one. And I think the ending of that game is incredible, like so amazing. And I won't spoil it for people, but it, it's just great. And But I will say this one funny thing that happened when I did beat that game. 
And this isn't actually the ending, but there's a part, it, it kind of has like one of those fake endings and then the game continues. But during the fake ending, you have this really climactic moment where you fight this other character and you kill him. And then you're like leaving and there's this sad song playing. And I remember I was riding the horse and I was trying to get into the moment. So I was riding the horse very slowly through the forest as this somber music is playing. And I was just taking everything that happened in and then a bear came out of nowhere and fucking killed me. Like knocked me off the horse and fucking killed me. <laughs> and I just started laughing so hard because I was like, that is amazing. Like it's just <laughs> so perfect that this moment was ruined. <laughs> like, I love it. It's still one of the most memorable moments in gaming for me. But yeah, I love Red Dead Redemption 1's ending. And I really liked Red Dead Redemption 2. So like I said, I'm not gonna discriminate against a AAA game. Red Dead Redemption 2 is probably the, the last AAA game that I played and completed and enjoyed. And I don't like Grand Theft Auto all that much. So, you know, I played three and four, or no, I played three in Vice City. Um, and I didn't play San Andreas, didn't play four, didn't play five, not gonna play six. So, uh, yeah. And uh, don't try to convince me to play Grand Theft Auto. Like, I don't care. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry. What do you do when you're having writer's block, zero motivation? What's one of your favorite memories for that burnout feeling all of us creative people suffer from? I think the thing, the thing that I found that works for me, and again, I think creativity is very subjective and I think people need to try out a bunch of stuff to figure out what works for them. And the thing that I found that works for me is scheduling my time to be creative, like to work on videos, write scripts. I block, I use Google Calendar and I block out time that where I'm gonna do stuff. Like I'm like, all right, from from this time to this time, I'm gonna work on this script. From this time to this time, I'm gonna, you know, do a voiceover. And and that helps a lot, like having a schedule. I used to be someone who tried to just be like, oh, you know, whenever the moment strikes me and I feel that moment of inspiration, that's when I'll work on something. But then what ends up happening is I'm a procrastinator by nature. So then I never end up doing what I wanna do. So keeping a schedule and trying to stick to it has been helpful on for me, honestly, and has made me more creative. Some people might, hear that and think like oh that sounds so like that sounds just like work and not like being creative and but you know being creative is work especially if you're trying to put out you know a thing anything like you know doesn't you know i do videos it could be a piece of writing like a novel or a short story or it could be a piece of music or it could be a painting or you know whatever like it's you're trying to accomplish something so it is work in some sense and you need to put in the work to complete it so for me i found scheduling stuff helps and then but i don't stick rigidly to a schedule like i i am a, kind of fluid with it and flexible and if i'm writing especially writing a script or something um, if i'm just having trouble and i'm not feeling it or, or i'm being like overly negative or something because i really don't want to be like super negative in my videos i like poking fun at stuff but i don't want to i don't want to just be mean so if i'm ever if that's ever happening i'll just walk away i'll take a break i'll go for a walk do something else you know maybe do like a physical activity just to kind of completely reset uh i think that's helpful you've covered a lot of horror and horror adjacent games i'm wondering what's your favorite horror genre and what's your favorite movie in that genre my favorite horror film is john carpenter's in the mouth of madness uh, I just love that movie. I think it's so weird and creepy and just, I, I love most of what John Carpenter has done. So his horror films, his action films, uh, They Live is another great one, which is not really a horror film. It's more sci-fi action, but it's still, that's one of my favorite John Carpenter films as well. I really like David Cronenberg, I like Scanners and Videodrome. Uh, and I like a lot of supernatural horror as well. Uh, ghosts and demons and stuff like that. Not a big fan of slasher films. There's a few that I like, like the original Halloween and like the first Nightmare on Elm Street. Those are classics, but not really big into the slasher genre. And I really like folklore horror. I've mentioned like Japanese folklore and I like a lot of Japanese horror films from like the 60s and even stuff from like the 50s, like black and white stuff, uh, like Kuro Neko and Kwaidan and Onibaba. It's a really crazy one. Uh, there's one from the 70s called House, Houseu. Look up, I think it's 1973, House. That movie's insane. <laughs> like, watch it and then show it to friends who've never heard of it because watching a friend's reaction, like showing someone that movie and watching their reaction is just it's the best. It's such a weird movie. 
uh, and that's a horror film too. So yeah, stuff like that's really great. And I have a bunch of like Criterion Collection stuff of like old Japanese horror films. Uh, and then I really like David Lynch too, which I mean, he can, I think he can be considered horror. At least he has a lot of horror elements. Like, like I recently rewatched uh, Lost Highway, which I've seen before. And, it, and the first time I saw it, I didn't, not that I didn't like it. I was just like, wow, that's overwhelming. But then I watched it again recently and I was like, this movie's excellent. Like, it's so good. Uh, and like Twin Peaks Firewalk with me is a horror, that is a horror film. Like, and, and it's a great film. Like the Laura Palmer's journey in that movie is just insane. And Cheryl, Cheryl Lee is an incredible actress, like just a great performance. Uh, so yeah, stuff like that. I really enjoy. Greetings from Finland. Before my question, love the style, way you do your videos, keep them coming. You got it. Uh, so question, can you mention a game or games that never were released? You feel bummed that didn't make it to the store shelves, didn't make it to store shelves. Or do you feel like a release that got postponed to the next generation consoles would have been better in the previous, like Onimusha? One that I would choose would be this original sequel to the 2006 Prey, Prey 2. That game looked amazing. Like it looked like they were going to do some pretty incredible stuff. And unfortunately it got canceled so i think that game looked great and then something that got released next gen but would have been better in a previous generation i think that anything that was like that was probably better off for getting re, -re like i think onimusha was better off being released on the ps2 so i think any of those cases i think it was better off but it is interesting to think about what they would have been like on the previous generation it would have been cool to like try them out and play them so that's for sure have you played Zanky Zero Last Beginning? No, I haven't. That's cheating to get on your list. Oh, you buddy. Do you play... So the, I guess the real question is, do you play any MMOs? Uh, I used to play Final Fantasy XIV, and I have a kind of a personal story about that game because I... So I played it a few years ago, and it was during the time where my grandfather was basically dying of, of cancer. And I started playing it around the time that I heard the news. It was, there was just so much going on like with, in my life at that time, like work and, and family and then keeping up with news about, about that going on. And it was during COVID, it was in 2020 when no one really knew what was going on. And uh, you know, I just, I could only really talk to him through like FaceTime and stuff. And uh, it was really rough. So I dealt with that like during the day. And then at night I would just sit and play Final Fantasy 14 for a couple hours before bed. And it was always, it was just an escape, you know? It was a world and there were these people that I met and just kind of hanging out in this other world and doing these things. And it was just something to focus on that wasn't, you know, all this other stuff. And then, you know, he passed and then it was still there to help me kind of get through the grief period. But then once that started to fade, I mean, the grief, you never really get over a loss, but you know, once it started to like, you know, so it's like, okay, we're, you know, we're just have to move past this. You know, I was still playing Final Fantasy 14, but I started playing it like less and less. And then it had been then like a few weeks. And then I remember the last time I logged in, like I was just like, I don't, I don't know, I don't need this anymore. And it's not that, it's not that it was, I mean, it was a coping thing for that time and what was going on, but it's, it's not that I look at that game and feel those, all those feelings again, like, cause I see news about it and stuff and I'm like, oh cool, there's a new expansion and stuff like that. And I don't automatically think about that time and about my grandfather, but I don't know, actually playing the game, I just felt like I don't, I just don't need to do this anymore. So yeah, but that's the only MMO that I ever played and I really enjoyed it. I think the storyline is one of the best Final Fantasy stories in a long time and it's, it's a great game, but yeah, don't really play it anymore. And I enjoy watching um, Josh Strife Hayes, who does a series called Best MMO or Worst MMO Ever. <laughs> yeah, Worst MMO Ever. And I really like watching those videos and seeing all these different uh, MMOs that are out there and the mechanics and stuff like that. But I don't really have any interest in trying any of them or playing any other MMOs, so. Love your channel. I'm learning about so many classic games. Here's a few questions. Have you ever played Haunting Ground PS2? One of my favorite games. Yeah, I've heard, I, I mean, I've seen a lot about that game. It's got a dog in it. That's awesome. <laughs> like, yeah, but I've never played it. What are some of your favorite non-horror games? Well, I don't just cover horror on the channel and I don't just play horror games. So there's too many to mention. Like I love a lot of games that aren't horror, so. And I've mentioned a lot of them 
uh, earlier in this video anyway, so yeah. And then three, will you ever do a face reveal? I don't think so. There's no point because what I'm doing doesn't, I don't need my face plastered on things. I don't, you, if you ever see me on a thumbnail making a YouTube O face, you should just unsubscribe because it's over. Like it's done, it's done. So yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Seeing as your thing is partly dungeons and dungeon crawling and your intro is from Shining in the Darkness, what would you say is your favorite dungeon crawler? A second question is, have you ever played any of the Shin Megami Tensei games? So Shin Megami Tensei, we covered that one. Favorite dungeon crawler? It's hard to pick a favorite. Etrian Odyssey 3 is a really good one. I, I really love that game, especially the third one. I've played other Etrian Odyssey games and I like them, but the third one is my favorite. And then I like Wizardry 7. That's an amazing game. Might Magic 4 and 5 combined. The World of Zine is great. Shining the Holy Ark is another one of my favorites. So yeah, those are those are some of my favorites. What do you think is the most underappreciated part of dungeon crawlers or dungeon games in general? Underappreciated part? I think it's the feeling of, of adventure. It, dungeon crawlers, most of them, you really have to use your imagination to get into. Like you're, a lot of them have you just creating a party of characters you don't really have any dialogue usually there's not much story so it's really about exploring and being just an adventurer in a world and you have to kind of wrap your mind around that and kind of create your own kind of narratives and stories for your characters and your party and so i think that is something that's difficult for people to get into especially people who are more accustomed to rpgs with heavy story focus and stuff like that. So yeah, but I think that sense of adventure is the most underappreciated, like the thing that, and the thing that people will not understand just by looking at screenshots or gameplay footage of a dungeon crawler game. Do you have a favorite game developer? Who are they and why? Uh, again, favorites are tough for me to pick, but I mean, I really like Quintet, who did uh, like Act Razor and Soul Blazer, Illusion of Gaia, Terra Enigma, Robotrek, Grand Stream Saga, like all those games are great and they just have a very distinct style uh, and I really like their stuff. I wish they were still around making games. Also really like From Software, like from the beginning to, to now, like they just have such an interesting arc with how they developed and, and there's a lot of things that they did that Miyazaki took that and kind of like used in different ways or kind of perfected, which I think get attributed to him, but were around in FromSoft games from the very beginning. Like, great level design and the atmosphere and the difficulty. Like, that was all stuff that was already in most From Software games. So, yeah, From Software is great. Quintet's great. I, I'll, I'll stick with those two for now. <laughs> there's probably, there's definitely others, but off the top of my head, those two. And our last question, how was your Thanksgiving? It was good. I hope you had a great one. If, you, if it's all right to ask, of course it is. What's your one year plan with your channel? Stay awesome, dude. And he's using my little uh, YouTube member emoji from Juggernaut, which is a game that I have not covered yet, but I'll get to it. My one year plan with the channel, I don't, I don't think I have a one year plan, but I mean, I could tell you for next year, I, I do have planned out what I'm gonna do for the first few videos. And um, I'm gonna be digging pretty deep into the obscurity barrel for those ones because um, there's just some cool games that I've wanted to talk about that I haven't had a chance to yet so we're gonna do that next year I'm gonna get to more of your recommendations next year Baroque will be coming next year <laughs> at some point I'm gonna try to cover some more indie games uh, get back to that. I don't know if I'm gonna do shorter like indie previews. It might be more like a, a disillusion video where I did like a full video on an indie game, but I do want, there's some indie games that I that I really wanna cover. And then there's also some other stuff that I haven't done yet that, uh, that I wanna cover as well, like some RPGs and there's some 16-bit games from like Super Nintendo and, and Genesis slash Mega Drive that I wanna do. And I haven't done stuff like that yet, so that'll be interesting. I mean, the channel is still young. It's only like eight and a half months at the time that I'm recording this. So there's still a lot of, I'm still like feeling things out. There's a lot that I'm seeing, you know, what kind of formats and things I can do that will interest people. And I've figured out like people seem to really like the story focused videos. So that's something that's never going to go away. And, then, and I enjoy doing those videos a lot. So but there's other stuff that I want to try out next year that, yeah, I'm excited for. So, so yeah, there's just going to be more, more chilling, more dungeons. Yeah, dungeon crawlers too. I'm going to get back to doing some 
some actual dungeon crawler games as well. Uh, so yeah, but uh, that's it for the question. So thank you everyone who who asked a question. Uh, thank you anyone who stuck around to watch the video this 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 long. I mean, on my I took some breaks and I fucked up a few things so like so this this recording right now is at like two hours and 50 minutes i don't know how long the finished video is going to be but yeah if you've stuck around till this point thank you and i just want to say thank you to everyone who's supported the channel over the last you know ever since it started just eight months ago i mean it's crazy i never expected to have this many subscribers and this many people anticipating new videos for me this quickly like i figured it would take like i said earlier in the video when i was answer answering one of the questions i figured it would take years to reach this point and honestly <laughs> when i became a youtube partner back in august i was thinking about milestones and i was like maybe it maybe like 10,000 subscribers i'll do a q and a video that'll be fun but i need like at least 10,000 people cuz i i want to get at least a, a, a bunch of questions and i was like yeah yeah 10,000 like i probably won't reach that for i don't know like yeah a couple years <laughs> and and then you know uh, just a few weeks later we were at 10,000 subscribers and i <laughs> i was just like i'm not ready to do a q a video yet so i pushed it off till the end of the year but yeah that's just insane like it's insane how how fast the channel's grown and i just have all of you to thank like i re i really believe that the success of the channel is only half mine i mean I, I make the videos of course but if it weren't for all of you watching and sharing and commenting and liking the videos then this then it would this would be nowhere it would just be me you know posting videos and, and that's it so really thank you all so much uh thanks to all the patrons and youtube members who support the channel if you would like to join them as a dungeon dweller you can click uh either the join button on the page for a youtube membership or click the patreon link in the description of this video to become a patron i have different different tiers but if you donate five dollars or more you get your name read out loud at the end of videos like these dungeon architects benifer 94 half hp high food court izzy lexus kyowa nekat the brave stefano Arenya, and tony lee and also these dungeon connoisseurs anjan 01 churm slurm chiral spiral crippler jones dazed clockwork dika dico Glitter Throat, Goats and Goblins, Indigo Happy, Irregular Rob, Gemma, Joshua Weber, Mr. Independent, Noel the Monkey, Old Dead Lemons, Please Keep Making Videos, Rez, Ribbon Black, Samuel Pandianian, True Axiom, Warrior Song, Where Am I, Help, and Zach Diedrich. Thank you all for your support. Thank you all for watching. Have a great holiday. Have a great new year. I'll see you early in January with another video. Uh, we're going to be throwing it back. Point and click. Really obscure one. So I'll see you then. Dungeon Chill. Out.